This is the video for uh, Lecture 8B, which is uh, renal physiology. We're continuing with the discussion of renal physiology. And here you see a photomicrograph of a glomerulus inside a glomerular capsule. There's the capsule, and all these round structures are tubules throughout the body of the rest of the kidney. Um, let's move on. So some of these diagrams you've already seen uh, remind you that this is the outer part of the kidney. This is the cortex and uh, in the interior here we have the medulla all through this area here and the <clears throat> fluid that's urine essentially is uh, released uh, here at the tip of each of these uh, pyramids, which happens to be called the papilla, but it's the very tip of the renal pyramids and it goes into these larger tubular structures, the calyces that all lead down to the pelvis and then down the ureter. So another diagram showing, uh, <clears throat> highlighting particular parts of the renal uh, anatomy. I should tell you that the best uh, medical diagrams and this person drew I think several every day of his life for 20 or 30 years are, the best ones are by Netter the best illustrations <clears throat> so the nephron is the uh, functional unit that can form uh, urine in the kidneys there's a million in each kidney as you know and they uh, process in the nephron uh, starts with the uh, glomerulus where the initial filtrate uh, forms gets filtered across the wall of the glomerulus and the podocytes into the glomerular Bowman's capsule and here you see uh, some of the finer detail of structure of the uh, glomerular capsule with the glomerulus inside this is the distal convoluted tubule here as it comes up near the uh, Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule where the tubular system originated the very same one it comes back and in the wall of that uh, distal convoluted tubule right near the <clears throat> glomerulus are the macula densa cells which together with the juxtaglomerular cells around the afferent arteriole form the juxtaglomerular apparatus Cortical nephrons, I've told you before, about 85% of nephrons are cortical nephrons. The glomerulus for these is located in the cortex. Those are all nephrons. The glomerulus is in the cortex, and the loop of Henle dips down into the medulla. Juxtamedullary nephrons are located closer. The glomerulus is closer to the corticomedullary junction, and the loop of Henle dives down deeper into the medulla to form uh, and, and for that reason has the ability to form a more concentrated urine. This diagram illustrates the two different types of uh, nephrons, the cortical nephron and the juxtaglomerular nephron, uh, juxtamedullary nephron, but it does leave out, and the, uh, what it leaves out is shown on the next slide, it leaves out part of the anatomy, which are the peritubular capillaries that are around the tubules up here and up here. So this is a more accurate diagram. Uh, <clears throat> and here you see these uh, specialized uh, peritubular capillaries called the vasa recta that are in the, around the loop of Henle for juxtamedullary nephrons. Okay, so every nephron does have two capillary beds, the glomerulus inside the glomerular capsule where filtration occurs and the peritubular capillaries surrounding the tubular structures where uh, reabsorption and secretion occur. Every glomerulus is fed, bl fed meaning blood leading in, fed by an afferent arteriole and drained by efferent arteriole, which then leads to the peritubular car capillaries, that second capillary bed. The blood pressure in the glomerulus is unusually high uh, these uh, 
this, these capillaries have to be able to uh, form filtrate so the pressure uh, in there is higher than you would normally find in a capillary. The afferent arterial feeding into the glomerulus has a larger diameter allowing for more flow in and it's a larger diameter than the efferent arterial and therefore that helps maintain pressure because the outlet is narrower and there's more resistance to outflow and so there's a higher pressure inside. Fluids and solutes can be forced out of the blood through the entire length of glomerulus to form that first fluid or called the filtrate. And that filtrate has quite a large volume, as I've said before. Most of this is going to, uh, at least the water in the uh, NACL, is going to be reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Nevertheless, uh, it's formed there. Peritubular capillaries, that second capillary bed, is a low-pressure porous capillary. It's uh, adapted ideally for absorption of molecules that are being reabsorbed from the tubular structure. Um, <clears throat> the vasa recta, I told you, are the long efferent arterioles of juxtamedullary nephrons that surround the uh, loop of Henle. And they're shown uh, here and around this structure here. Okay, let's talk about alterations in vascular resistance, uh, which are mediated by changes in the diameter of arterioles, so that uh, there's changes in blood pressure. You should realize that if you, if uh, incoming uh, blood vessel dilates, then more there'll be an increased flow into a glomerulus, and if an outgoing uh, uh, constricts, there'll be again higher uh, uh, pressure inside, or if it dilates, there'll be lower pressure because the drainage is higher, less resistance. So these can change. Resistance in the afferent arterioles help protect glomerulus from fluctuations in the systemic blood pressure. Changes in systemic blood pressure have to be, uh, the kidneys have to respond to that to maintain a steady uh, pressure within the glomeruli, so you get a steady um, formation of, of filtrate. There's a, there needs to be a maintenance of uh, high, uh, homeostatic maintenance of the glomerular filtration rate, the rate at which uh, filtrate is formed in the glomerulus. And that can occur, that steady uh, glomerular filtration rate or GFR can occur even if there are swings which there are in the rest of the circulation the systemic circulation there are swings in pressure with activity or posture or you know more or less uh, uh, changes in, in um, uh, what the person is doing and what they're experiencing in terms of the efferent arterioles this can um, uh, have an effect on the glomerular pressure if you have uh, <clears throat> uh, vasoconstriction in the efferent arterial it can help uh, maintain a higher glomerular pressure um, and uh, vasoconstriction can also help reduce the hydrostatic pressure in the downstream peritubular capillaries okay the specialized structure, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which includes the macula densa cell and the juxtaglomerular cells in the uh, wall of the distal convoluted tubule and around the end of the uh, afferent arterial as it enters into the to capsule to form the glomerulus. This structure, um, um, this structure, uh, <clears throat> In terms of, uh, in, at, at least in terms of the juxtaglomerular cells, uh, these cells are uh, enlarged, uh, granular containing or granule containing smooth muscle cells. So they're specially differentiated smooth muscle cells that have granules inside them. And the granules contain a uh, hormone called renin. Essentially, these are receptors for changes in pressure. Um, so you can 
uh, view them as acting as mechanoreceptors. The macula densa cells are in the wall of the uh, distal convoluted tubule, lying close to the juxtaglomerular cells, and these act as chemoreceptors or osmoreceptors. What they monitor is the nature of the fluid that's inside. Let's see if I can get a. No, let's do it this way. Just a second. They monitor the chemical and osmotic, or the nature of the fluid that's inside the distal convoluted tubule. <clears throat> so fluid is flowing past these cells, and it has particular characteristics. I'm going to get into that, and that's what these cells structures monitor and respond to. In terms of the filtration membrane, as I told you, there's a fenestrated endothelial cells lining the walls of the paving the walls of the glomerular capillaries, and there are uh, uh, podocytes outside wrapped around the glomerular capsule. And there's a basement a membrane in between that acts as the filtration membrane. And you've seen this diagram before. Okay, now to get back to the physiology of it, uh, large amounts of blood pass through the kidneys every day. Um, I wouldn't worry about these numbers, but just realize that uh, an awful lot of the blood is constantly being passed through the kidneys and constantly undergoing filtration. And that, that of course, the first fluid, as you know, is filtrate. It contains everything that the plasma does except for all, virtually all the proteins. A few small proteins might get across. Um, <clears throat> now, the principles of fluid dynamics account for uh, movement of fluid uh, across the wall of every capillary. And uh, we covered that when we did uh, cardiovascular physiology, when we looked at the uh, um, net filtration pressure across the wall of capillary beds and the rest of the circulation. But the same principles apply in the glomerulus. Uh, however, the glomerulus uh, operates uh, differently, certainly from other capillaries in that the Filter, uh, filtration membrane is much more permeable in the glomerulus. The glomerular blood pressure is much higher. And overall, there is a greater or higher net filtration pressure in the glomerulus. As I said before, plasma proteins don't get filtered. They don't appear in the filtrate normally. But what they do is uh, they stay in the blood and they help to maintain the um, uh, osmotic uh, potential or uh, the osmotic potential of the blood, the ability to pull water back, fluid back into the bloodstream. So they uh, are important in maintaining osmotic potential. And osmotic potential, it's not easy writing uh, like this, but okay. The osmotic potential of the blood, the ability to pull water back from the uh, tissue uh, from the capsule space uh, and osmotic potential is also called oncotic pressure colloid osmotic pressure same thing as osmotic potential or oncotic pressure okay so what are the uh, variables the uh, main variables involved in uh, the net fil pr filtration pressure across the glomerulus. Uh, the net filtration pressure, in fact, is equal to the uh, glomerular hydrostatic pressure. That's the hydrostatic pressure of the blood within the glomerular capillaries minus the difference between the uh, osmotic, potent uh, osmotic potential or oncotic pressure of the glomerular blood and the uh, colloid uh, osmotic pressure, mm, I'm sorry, these are the same, oncotic pressure, colloid osmotic pressure, and the hydrostatic pressure of the uh, capsule. In other words, the, the, the Bowman's cap, the fluid in the Bowman's capsule can also have a certain amount of pressure acting in the opposite direction from the hydrostatic pressure of the 
blood in the glomerulus. So it's the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries minus these two pressures, um, which are tending to uh, move fluid back into the glomerulus. The colloid osmotic pressure or colloid osmotic potential of the uh, glomerular blood, the proteins in the blood, and the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular space, uh, glomerular capsular space. And so here you see this equation and the relative forces. This is the hydrostatic pressure of the glomerulus of the blood here pushing outwards, pushing fluid outwards. And remember that uh, when you see these kind of values, it's going to change from source to source somewhat, slightly, but the overall uh, numbers like this might vary depending on what source you see, but the overall effect is more or less the same. There is a net outward pressure, and that's how filtrate forms. So the hydrostatic pressure of the uh, blood, HPG, uh, pushes outwards. The blood colloid osmotic pressure pulls, which is due to proteins in the blood plasma, pulls fluids inward, water inward, back into the space. Let me get a different color. Pulls fluids back in. And the capsular hydrostatic pressure is pushing, uh, exerting some force inward also. The net effect is uh, 55 minus 30 plus 15, which is 45. So 55 minus 45 net effect is overall a uh, net outward pressure of uh, 10 millimeters mercury. Net filtration pressure normally found and maintained pretty steady uh, within the uh, glomerulus in the kidneys. Glomerulus. So this is a key feature of kidneys, the glomerular filtration rate. This is what really, to a large extent, is what it's all about. Maintenance of a proper, stable uh, glomerular filtration rate, uh, producing a steady amount of uh, filtrate in the glomeruli, and then that filtrate undergoes resorption and secretion so it could change in the volume, volume of urine being put out will get altered, but that'll be due to, um, for the most part, due to reabsorption and secretion. Key factors that govern uh, the glomerular filtration rate include the total surface area available, the permeability of that filtration me membrane, and the net filtration pressure. So, if, if everything is normal, then filtration membrane permeability and total surface area are stable. And the GFR will be directly proportional to the net glomerular filtration rate. In the end, will be directly proportional to net filtration pressure. <clears throat> so if you do have changes in glomerular filtration rate, it's going to be because of changes in glomerular blood pressure, which uh, should normally not occur. It should be a steady uh, pressure. If, however, GFR is too high, if the rate of glomerular filtration is too high, then uh, filtrate, filtrate is formed, too much filtrate is formed, cannot be uh, reabsorbed fast enough. The solutes that go into it, because the flow is so high that solutes that normally get reabsorbed can't get reabsorbed fast enough and are lost in the urine. So a high GFR, an abnormally high GFR will cause water loss, will cause uh, solute like um, sodium loss, uh, and that's not good. If the glomerular filtration rate is too low, and this is an important concept to understand. When the glomerular filtration rate is too low, the volume of the filtrate is lower than it should be, is lower than normal. Filtrate formation is uh, lower and le uh, less in volume. And not everything, that's an exaggeration, but too much gets reabsorbed, uh, including waste even, because the fluid spends too much time in the in the tubular system and 
uh, too much gets reabsorbed so that it is lower in volume and uh, too many of the solutes are being reabsorbed. Even waste solutes can be reabsorbed and are not normally secreted. So <clears throat> there are a number of different regulatory mechanisms that operate to try and stabilize and maintain control, uh, stable uh, performance and levels of the Marilyn filtration rate. There are built-in intrinsic controls, and this, this is called renal auto regulation, and they respond to um, um, they uh, renal auto regulatory mechanisms involve adjustments in resistance to blood flow, with um, changes in uh, blood vessel diameter. You can get changes in resistance to blood flow. And they help to maintain a steady, near constant glomerular filtration rate. There are other control mechanisms, uh, homeostatic regulatory control mechanisms that are extrinsic to the kidneys, and they indirectly regulate the GFR by changing, maintaining systemic blood pressure in the rest of the body's vasculature. So we're gonna get into that in more detail. First, we're going to talk about the intrinsic controls, which include a myogenic mechanism and a tubular glomerular feedback mechanism, and then extrinsic controls that involve uh, uh, the out output from the central nervous system from the autonomic nervous system. Uh, this is um, involuntary tissue, which is controlled, of course, by the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system the uh, two divisions of course are the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system i'm just going to put s for sympathetic and p for parasympathetic divisions there is also uh, hormonal regulation which is <clears throat> extrinsic for the most part to the kidney okay let's start in with intrinsic regulation, renal autoregulation. This is built-in autoregulation. Under normal circumstances, in fact, renal autoregulation, self-regulation, can maintain a const, near constant GFR. It uh, involves controlling the diameter of the afferent and efferent arterioles that enter and exit each of the nephrons. Uh, it's no different from, you know, a system of pipes. If you increase the diameter of the inlet there will be increased flow in and higher pressure therefore downstream if you decrease the inflow by decreasing the diameter of the inflow and when i talk about inflow and for glomeruli i'm talking about the afferent arterioles if you decrease the diameter by vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole then there's less flow in and a lower blood pressure will uh, be inside the glomerulus <clears throat> and the opposite for the outflow, the efferent arterioles. So this uh, autoregulatory effect, intrinsic controls are, uh, involving uh, renal autoregulation, as I said, have uh, two types of controls, myogenic and tubular glomerular feedback. Okay, let's talk about more in more detail about the myogenic reflex, although I did mention uh, quite a bit actually in the previous slide. It involves a response uh, to changes in uh, pressure in the renal blood vessels. So um, a lot of it uh, actually uh, occurs because of the built-in tendency of smooth muscle in the body to contract in response to being stretched. So that's an uh, automatic response, actually, of quite a bit of smooth muscle. It happens in the gut, for example, as food moves along and stretches the uh, diameter of the gut, it tends to uh, contract in response. If, and I, I hope you're clear on the idea of systemic blood pressure, the general overall systemic blood pressure in the rest of the system, if it is increased, then it will trigger afferent arterioles and that feed into the glomeruli to constrict. You'll get vasoconstriction. Uh, 
and so the blood flow to the glomeruli is are is reduced and when the blood flow in is reduced you'll get a, a, a lower glomerular hydrostatic pressure if blood flow was pressure was too high going in then uh, the glomerular hydrostatic pressure would be too high and therefore filtration rate the GFR would be too high so remember that the kidneys are trying to maintain a steady GFR and they do that to a large extent in terms of myogenic reflex myogenic control built-in autoregulatory mechanisms through uh, changing the diameter of the uh, afferent arterioles so that uh, if its pressure is too high afferent arterioles constrict and the glomerular hydrostatic pressure drops and that prevents a lot of this in fact is is a mechanism that prevents G, uh, glomerular blood pressure from reaching potentially damaging levels one uh, one serious consequence of abnormally chronically high blood pressure is in fact injury to the glomeruli in the kidneys and uh, sometimes even young people have um, um, can have fairly high blood pressure uh, and uh, in a short period of time really quite high blood pressure and systolic blood pressure and in a short time can injure damage their uh, glomeruli to a significant extent <clears throat> the opposite situation where the systemic blood pressure is lower than it should be lower than normal will trigger an aff afferent arterioles that enter into the glomerulus to dilate so you get vasodilation blood flow in the glomerulus rises glomerular hydrostatic pressure rises and therefore the uh, GFR let's change colors the GFR in this case okay will rise because after all GFR is directly proportional to uh, net filtration pressure and here the result of uh, afferent arterioles vasoconstricting or constricting is that the GFR will drop down so this is a nice way a built-in intrinsic autoregulatory way of maintaining a steady GFR in the face of um, shifting systemic blood pressures now the other built-in mechanism uh, involves the juxtaglomerular apparatus made of the made up of the macula densa cells and the uh, JG or juxtaglomerular cells <clears throat> it is a feedback uh, mechanism directed by the macula densa cells they uh, as you know as I've told you before they're here mm, here in the wall of the difficult when I say here and I don't highlight that's why I highlight here in the wall of the uh, distal convoluted tubule and they can act as a chemoreceptor and osmoreceptor on the uh, filtrate within the distal convoluted tubule so they can monitor the uh, osmolality or osmolarity of the filtrate as it passes through this area the response is to the osmolarity uh, most of which is due to sodium chloride if the GFR the glomerular filtration rises then the filtration flow as I told you before it's and this is something to, to, to uh, be sure that you understand this idea you know more glomerular the rate of formation remember it's a rate so rate of formation of filtrate uh, rises then more filtrate is being formed and the flow can be too fast and therefore there's not enough time for re appropriate levels of reabsorption to occur so reabsorption is not occurring to a proper extent is reduced and uh, the filtrate in the end will have higher than normal levels of sodium chloride and that'll be that'll be going out and will be lost in the urine macula densa cells can monitor or sense the uh, uh, osmotic 
uh, osmolarity of the fluid in that distal convoluted tu tubule. And in response, they can release uh, local vasoactive compounds that can change uh, uh, the diameter of the afferent arterioles. They can induce vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole. So by inducing vasoconstriction of afferent arterioles, the net filtration pressure inside the glomerulus will drop, um, blood flow drops, and therefore the net filtration pressure drops, the height, which is mostly due to the hydrostatic pressure of that blood, and the glomerular filtration will drop, and therefore it brings it back to a balanced uh, amount of uh, filtrate and allows for enough time for that filtrate to be appropriately processed. So when it flows past the macula densa cells in the distal convoluted tubule, it is a appropriate flow, appropriate uh, osmolarity level or osmolality level. So those are two intrinsic autoregulatory um, processes that can help maintain a normal GFR in kidneys. <clears throat> Now, um, if uh, glomerular filtration rate slows, is slower than normal, then the filtration flow is uh, reduced, the formation of filtrate is reduced, and there's too much time, the fluid, that filtrate fluid will spend too much time in the tubule and reabsorption will be too high. There's too much reabsorption, and the too much of the water gets reabsorbed, too much, or, too much of the sodium chloride gets reabsorbed in that water will flow, uh, follow with the sodium. And so you have a reduced osmolarity lower than normal. And in this case, there are vasoactive compounds. Uh, those, the release of those is inhibited and the result is vasodilation of the afferent arterial. Vasodilation, of course, allows for an increased flow into the blood flow into the glomerulus rises and therefore the hydrostatic pressure and of the blood and thus the net filtration pressure rises and the glomerular filtration rate rises. Now there's more filtrate being formed um, and so the flow is increasing in the tubules. There's less time for that filtrate to be uh, processed and undergo reabsorption and, and, and the appropriate amount as opposed to um, too much reabsorption of sodium will, will, the appropriate reabsorption will occur. All right, let's move on here. So under normal circumstances, uh, renal autoregulation, that built-in intrinsic regulatory effect uh, in the kidneys can handle uh, changes that might occur, uh, normal, rhythms, uh, normal fluctuations in blood pressure and therefore uh, glomerular filtration rate and can in fact, despite that, maintain a near constant GFR uh, uh, by maintaining co a near constant blood flow through the kidneys, uh, the kidney the glomeruli of the nephrons, even over a systemic arterial pressure uh, ranging between 80 and 180, which is quite a wide range. So even with fluctuations between that and in you and normal people, you can get those kind of fluctuations uh, due to posture and activity. And they're minor, they, they, they you know, they're, they're short, but they do occur. And uh, <clears throat> and this int these intrinsic uh, regulatory mechanisms uh, can help. Uh, Counteract, can counteract them and help maintain a constant uh, GFR so the kidneys are fine. Kidney function is fine. I think this is a good place to stop for this uh, part and I'll start a new video after this.